I am Leah Aronofsky. I'm a fellow here in the fellow Society of Fellows. <laughs> no more. Uh, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Eric Baker. Um, Eric is a historian of American capitalism and the social sciences at Harvard University. He is currently a lecturer in the Department of the History of Science and the director of the Senior Honors Tutorial for the Undergrad Program. He received his PhD at Harvard in 2022 and a BA from Northwestern University, where he studied history, math, and geology. Uh, his research focuses on the culture of work in the modern United States and the role of scientific expertise in shaping workers' self-understanding. His first book, Make Your Own Job, The Entrepreneurial Work Ethic in Modern America is currently under contract with Harvard University Press. And the book analyzes the role of popular psychologists, policy experts, management intellect, and management intellectuals in reformulating the principles of the American work ethic amid the turbulence of 20th century US capitalism. His scholarly writing um, on topics that range from the history of think tanks, federal science policy, and post-positivist philosophy of science has appeared in Modern Intellectual History, History of the Human Sciences, Studies in History and Philosophy of Science, and Social Epistemology. He is a founding associate editor of The Drift, everyone's current favorite little mag of the moment, um, and he has written widely on labor, politics, and American history for magazines that include Harper's, N Plus One, The Baffler, Jewish Currents, and Jacobin. Um, and I think just this week, he has a piece out in Jewish Currents on um, bereavement leave on the history of bereavement leave and um it's and the sort of incompatibilities of capitalism and bereavement um i highly recommend it it's in jewish currents uh his talk today is called make your own job success and failure in the depression era united states thank you Thanks so much, Leah, for that introduction, for the Society of Fellows for having me and all of you for being here. It's great to see some old friends and, and colleagues, as well as those of you I'm looking forward to getting to know for the first time. Uh, it might sound a little weird to say, but I was really thrilled to hear that the fellows had chosen failure as the theme of this lecture series, because success and failure are central to my book project, Make Your Own Job, The Entrepreneurial Work Ethic in Modern America. I'm interested in how working people in the United States have understood the concepts of success and failure, what it meant to succeed or to fail, what it took to become successful, and conversely, what predisposed an individual to fail. What I show in the book is that these ideas about success and failure evolved in tandem with changes to the structure of American capitalism, and in particular to the workplace and the labor market. I focus on the cultural and intellectual figures and institutions that have mediated this relationship, self-help writers, management theorists, and policy experts, business schools, the business press, and the management consulting industry, and especially the ideological activity of management itself, the ideas and rhetoric about work and success that managers have promulgated and that employees have encountered in the course of their day-to-day -day work activity. They show that there's an interdependence between ideas about work and management. To know what makes for a successful manager, you need to know what makes for a successful employee. And conversely, to have some idea about what makes for a successful worker is always to imply some idea about how workers best ought to be managed. The overall narrative of the book charts the rise of what I call the entrepreneurial work ethic, which is my name for the constellation of ideas about work, management, and success that, I argue, has been hegemonic in the United States since the 1960s and pervasive since the turn of the 20th century. The contrast I draw is to what I call the industrious work ethic, which was hegemonic in the first decades of industrial capitalism, it's not to say capitalism as such, in the late 19th century. The industrious work ethic centered around themes of duty and perseverance. Work made a person self-sufficient, a producer rather than a parasite, and was thus intrinsically virtuous. Doing your allotted work diligently and without complaint accrued a kind of credit for yourself in the cosmic ledger increasing the odds that fortune would smile upon you in the fullness of time. This narrative, most famously expressed in the boys' novels of Horatio Alger, thrived as the nation industrialized. Then there was much work that needed doing. Industrial output in the decades after the Civil War grew roughly at the same rate as the industrial workforce. 
the nation could develop at precisely the rate at which new workers enlisted in the army of labor. To work was to contribute to this great project, to be a participant in the construction of modernity and the satisfaction of the needs of a continental empire. It's not to say that everyone in the industrial workforce worked happily, of course, but opprobrium most commonly targeted the idle rich, feasting vampirically on the labor of others rather than work as such, which remained a point of pride. It is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid, boasted the union anthem Solidarity Forever in 1915. But note the past tense. By then it was done. Prairies plowed, cities erected, mines dug, railroads laid. Near the century's close, people had started to whisper of industrial maturity. All their work had constructed a machine that would now continue to hum ever more efficiently without additional labor required. Once the foundations had been laid, captains of industry could focus their efforts on new techniques to squeeze additional productivity out of the resources, both human and material, that they already had on hand. Throughout most of the late 1910s and 1920s, new technological and managerial efficiencies allowed industrial production to expand without net additions to the manufacturing workforce, even without the net investment of capital, which is why the historian Martin Sklar describes this period as the advent of disaccumulationist capitalism. Many contemporaries, for good reason, saw mass unemployment on the horizon, but it was not to be, at least for first. Instead, early 20th century American capitalism conjured up an astonishing array of new industries oriented primarily around consumer goods production and especially service provision. You can see here on this chart the, this moment in the, the early 1920s when the so-called tertiary sector begins to uh, overtake the, um, the secondary sector of manufacturing workforce. The, the total sectoral composition of the labor force. The three most important new sectors were automobile manufacturing, which also produced a variety of new car servicing jobs, mass entertainment, including radio, movies, and magazines, and all the advertising they both required and facilitated, and the professions, including the accountants, lawyers, managers of various stripes, production technicians, and a bewildering assortment of all-purpose paper pushers in the corporations that coordinated production in the culture industries in automobile manufacturing. For the time being, these new industries absorbed the surplus workforce expelled from the older sectors of heavy industry, or even gave those sectors new life, as in the case of steel production. It was enough to avert an economic crisis, or more precisely, to push it back to 1929. We'll return to that momentarily. But in the meantime, it raised the specter of legitimation crisis, to co-opt a phrase from Jürgen Habermas. All of a sudden, the American economy was primarily oriented around the provision of goods and services that would have been, from the vantage point of a previous generation, totally unnecessary. Was it possible to be proud of work in these new sectors as it was in the days of industrialization? This question applied to low wage, manual and clerical workers, who were furthermore asked to tolerate increasingly invasive regimenting methods of labor management. They increasingly responded, a sort of echo of today's so-called great resignation with sky high rates of quitting. This question also applied to the white collar professionals who staffed corporate offices did intellectual and artistic work in the entertainment and cultural industries. For them, the question of the worthiness of their work was also provoked by laboring under conditions that early, earlier denizens of their class would have found demeaning, namely as permanent employees rather than independent proprietors. These changes also jeopardized the plausibility of the Horatio Alger success narrative associated with the industrious work ethic. For both upper and lower tier workers in the early 20th century, Work was no longer given in the way it was in the heyday of industrialization. At that time, it was usually obvious what work needed to be done, and the main question was whether a person had to do it themselves, or whether they were lucky enough to be able to profit from other people doing it for them. But work in the 20th century had to be found, no matter one's location in the economic hierarchy. Having work to do was now an accomplishment of sorts. It often required effort and cleverness, even a kind of work in its own right. The struggle to climb the professional ladder and the struggle to find good steady factory or service work acquired a weird homology on account of the fact that it was in each case a struggle. The main idea of the entrepreneurial work ethic, as I define it, was that the struggle was in some sense ennobling. It furnished the opportunity to prove one's merit, to exercise one's creativity, a new concept of the early 20th century, and to find work suited to one's personal endowments. The precarity and volatility of low-wage work in the age of capitalist surplus were transfigured into signs that freedom had at last triumphed over necessity in modern society. Precisely because the new sort of work, from car factories to cinemas, from classrooms to corporate offices, 
was not strictly necessary from the vantage point of pre-industrial American society, it had the potential to serve, so people thought, as an arena for self-actualization. People could now use their work to leave their individual mark on the world, to bring something new into existence. No longer required to do what society demanded of them, workers could instead do what they loved. At the beginning of the book, I locate the first stirrings of the entrepreneurial work ethic in new thought, a movement which blended idealist philosophy, theological liberalism, and themes from the new scientific discipline of psychology. New thought writers confronted head on the widespread sentiment that opportunity was growing scarce. They responded that each individual nonetheless retained the ability to create new opportunities. The Calvinist work ethic, they argued, had trained Americans to perform dutifully the work presented to them by circumstance, the New Thought Apostles maintained that in the 20th century, it would be necessary for Americans to tap into the creative spirit of the universe to generate new ideas and to develop their unique talents and to convert their ideas and talents into work for themselves. This is one popular uh, six, New Thought success periodical aptly titled Success. While the top selling New Thought writers addressed a white middle class audience, I also show its influence on Marcus Garvey, who argued that the maturation of the industrial economy created new opportunities for enterprising black workers. Often shut out of employment in heavy industry, Garvey argued, black entrepreneurs could create jobs supplying consumer goods and services to members of their own communities. Entrepreneurialism then originally gained traction in the United States as a guide to individual economic action, an explanation of how to work and manage more successfully in the modern age. In the Depression, which is the period I'd like to examine in detail today, it achieved salience for the first time in debates over public policy. Reinterpreted under Depression conditions, the doctrines of the entrepreneurial work ethic offered a vision of economic revitalization that emphasized neither an activist federal government nor munificent financiers, but rather ordinary working people who possessed the ability to create their own jobs despite the ongoing crisis. Many working Americans, to be sure, found this vision implausible or worse placing their hopes for dignity and economic security instead in collective labor organization and democratic or communist party politics. The depression era entrepreneurialism was by no means confined to economists and other elite intellectuals. It saturated the pages of the era's top help, self selling self-help authors, some of whom entered the political fray in opposition to the New Deal. And it thrived to a particular extent in the interstices of the industrial world, in sales and services rather than in manufacturing, among women and black Americans often excluded from unionized industrial workplaces and in small town geographies where large industrial corporations were not yet entrenched. With the rest of my time, I wanna walk you through three of the key sites in which this narrative unfolded during the depression. First in the sales industry, especially in the corporate culture of direct selling companies, then a media discourse about odd jobs and personal service businesses as an antidote to unemployment and finally, in the mass market self-help publishing industry. So first, sales. Selling professions formed the core readout of the entrepreneurial work ethic during the depression. On the eve of the crisis, this line of work figured much more prominently in the overall landscape of work in the US than it had a generation before. The advent of disaccumulationist capitalism expanded the American sales force in the early decades of the 20th century as manufacturing corporations discovered that their ability to sell rather than produce now functioned as the chief constraint on their rate of growth. Employment and distribution grew at triple the rate of production employment between 1870 and 1930. The depression only made the importance of the demand constraint and therefore the selling apparatus more palpable. The business outlook looks bright at the moment, wagered the bulletin of the National Automobile Dealers Association in a moment of optimism in November 1935, but bright or otherwise, goods must be sold. As a description of the imperatives that confronted business in the 30s, this assertion was unimpeachable. As a forecast of employment prospects, however, it was only partially true. Companies could hire salespeople to move unsold inventory, but if consumers refused to buy what they were selling, layoffs would still ultimately be inevitable. The depression truly advantaged only one particular corner of the sales world, the direct selling industry. When the economy that went into recession, companies that primarily sold goods to other businesses saw their sales forces contract alongside their manufacturing workforces. But companies that sold goods directly to consumers were on the whole more resilient. Those that focused on selling small, cheap products for personal and household use had the potential not merely to weather the storm, but positively to thrive. Salespeople had an easier time convincing consumers that these products, 
compared to large and expensive consumer products like automobiles were essential, or at least an insubstantial indulgence that remained compatible with the tightened household budget. This was especially true if they were able to deliver their pitch in the context of a one-on-one -on -one encounter at a consumer's home. And this was the heart of the direct selling strategy. Cheap, portable goods produced by a relatively small manufacturing workforce, and much larger roster of sales workers who circumvented retail outlets and approached consumers directly. The overall volume of sales in this sector roughly doubled during the 1930s, a striking contrast to the assembly lines uh, of heavy industry that remained idle. Quote, we are convinced that the right company with the right products, with the right selling representatives can develop a depression proof business, argued an executive of the California perfume company, makers of the Avon product line in 1932. The reinvigoration of direct selling in the 1930s in some ways represented a break with the tendency of early 20th century American capitalism towards the absorption of salespeople into the bureaucratically managed workforces of large corporations. In direct selling, the peddler of yore was reborn, not merely as an atavism, but as a symbol of the enduring entrepreneurial ingenuity of American working people. While some early 20th century executives hoped to create a tailorist science of selling that would allow managers to specify precisely the most efficient procedures for sales workers, the direct selling workforce, unsupervised on a day-to-day -day basis, relied by necessity on initiative and interpersonal skill. For industry advocates, this contrast was at the heart of direct selling's seemingly miraculous ability to prosper during the Depression. When men in all other lines of commerce are discouraged and many lie down abandoning the struggle, the pitch man goes courageously on, wrote James Ferdin, a traveling salesman known by his nom de guerre, the great Pizarro, in 1942. The inner resolve of the pitch man insulated him from the vicissitudes of the conventional labor market, the great Pizarro argued. The pitch man needs ask no man for a job. He creates his own job. Organizational innovations in the industry during the 1930s bolstered Booster's claims that direct selling work was a form of self-employment and thus the fruit of individual entrepreneurial initiative. After unsuccessfully experimenting in the late 1920s with schemes to organize sales workers as salaried corporate employees, a few prominent direct selling firms, most notably the California Perfume Company, shifted in the early 30s to a new model. It treated sellers as formerly independent business people who purchased their wares from the manufacturer and resold them to consumers. This model quickly became the industry standard in the wake of the momentous New Deal labor reforms of the mid-30s. The National Labor Relations Act, which created a right for many private sector workers to unionize. The Social Security Act, whose signature, signature federal retirement and disability benefits program was funded through a new payroll tax paid, paid by employers. And the Fair Labor and Standards Act, which created rights to a federal minimum wage and time and a half overtime pay. In 1936, the National Association of Direct Selling Companies successfully petitioned the Federal Trade Commission to certify that direct sales representatives employed as independent contractors were not considered company employees for the purposes of the major New Deal legislation. Companies didn't have to submit payroll taxes on their behalf or contribute to unemployment relief. Direct sales workers had no right to unionize and they were exempt from wages and hours regulations. By the decade's close, more or less all direct selling companies were telling their sales forces what the CPC had long told Avon distributors. Now you are in business for yourself. The FTC agreed. The spread of the independent contractor model was just one more factor driving direct selling companies to adopt an entrepreneurial rather than a scientific management style. That is to say, an approach to management that required workers to internalize the company's mission as their own and to exercise their own initiative in discharging their responsibilities rather than submitting to precise, ostensibly scientific instructions from higher ups. Even if salespeople were treated on paper as corporate employees, the latter method would have been intractable in managing an overwhelmingly rural sales force like that of the CPC. 80% of Avon sellers lived in towns of 2,500 or fewer, mostly located west of the Mississippi River. Instead, CPC turned to the central instrument of entrepreneurial management in the direct selling industry, inspirational company literature. All registered sellers received the Avon Outlook at least once a month. This pamphlet included up-to-date information about the Avon product line and other practical and logistical information, but it also sought to inculcate the company's success philosophy and to encourage sellers to devote themselves enthusiastically to their work. The Avon Outlook taught distributors a new language. CPC executives explained how best to guide your Avon business through the endless succession of sales campaigns waged seasonally by the company. 
In the typical fashion of entrepreneurial management, the periodical encouraged sales workers to model their own activity after the entrepreneurship of the firm's creative leader, David McConnell. Quote, our president, Mr. McConnell, is perhaps our most inspiring example of a man who built up an idea into a great business, boasted the May 1930 Outlook. McConnell's spirit, in turn, flowed down from the company offices to animate the work of ordinary Avon sellers across the country. All through our ranks are members of the organization, each contributing, building, day after day, year after year. The function of the independent contractor model then was not exactly to isolate the individual seller from the company, but to create a fantasy of equal status, a level playing field on which sellers could approach CPC executives as co-creators of the firm's success. If this fantasy allowed distributors to share in the glory of the company's booming sales during the 30s, it also placed the responsibility for individual failure squarely on their shoulders. But when you join the ranks of the Avon organization, your future success is in your hands, the Alec wrote. How you capitalize on it depends on your own efforts. The periodical often emphasized the extent of the help that the company had furnished its distributors in the form of sales materials as well as the advice dispensed in the Alec itself. Used correctly, these tools would guarantee successes beyond your wildest hopes. The unspoken implication was that a lack of success suggested the seller had used CPC's help incorrectly. Indeed, CPC executives occasionally suggested that all Depression-era misery was a consequence of individuals' failure to display the initiative and creativity of successful Avon distributors. Pessimists are whimpering over the unemployment situation, David McConnell sneered in a 1931 editorial. People are out of work, they say, and cannot find jobs. But Avon sales were booming, a fact which, to McConnell, indicated that much of the decade's unemployment was ultimately caused by mere weakness of will. The Alec and other CPC literature also played a crucial role in the company's efforts to overcome the insecurities of some members of its almost exclusively female sales force about the propriety of their devotion to their work. Outlook issues included portraits of many of the women who had made the Avon 500 Club by achieving net sales of at least $500. It's about $10,000 today. Much of the advice in the pages of the Outlook was dispensed not by male company executives, but by women sellers themselves, especially the winners of the periodical's regular letter writing contests. Women from across the US wrote to explain their sales strategies, which typically centered around the exploitation of female social networks. Avon women sold overwhelmingly to other women at their homes, in the ladies' lounge of the local high school, and at school events. CPC literature framed Avon selling as a distinguished act of feminine social service, not merely a business opportunity. But aside from the revenue obtained, I have been in a position to make new friends, minister to those in need of a friend, and help others to get on a better financial footing by urging them to take up the work too, testified Mrs. J. Shepard of Texas in the March 1936 issue. The intrinsically social, relational nature of selling facilitated depression era reconceptualization as acceptable women's work. It's not to say that men were excluded from or stigmatized within the selling profession in the 30s. Some direct selling companies employed overwhelmingly male sales forces and others did not emphasize gender one way or the other in their hiring practices. Instead, the increasing visibility of Avon women simply fed into broader cultural perceptions of direct selling as an island of dynamism within the depression's ocean of economic stagnation. Earlier in the 20th century, other players in the distribution sector, especially in the retail industry, sought to contrast their more sophisticated, modern, rationalized structure with the old-fashioned selling approach of the pitch man. But now, the entrepreneurial image of direct selling was suddenly at a premium. Such, at least, was the impression of William T. Grant, whose chain store behemoth had long implementized the intrusion of corporate bureaucracy into the sales world. Testifying before Congress in 1940, against an excise tax bill proposed by anti-monopoly New Dealers, Grant framed his store managers as independent businessmen on the direct selling model rather than mere employees. Quote, from the start, each manager of a Grant store has been a partner in the business in that he shared the profits of his store, Grant argued. Our managers are executives, not clerks, and when they have left our organization, they have proved able to successfully operate their own store. Clerks, whose initiative and ingenuity, Grant argued, would atrophy from underuse, were utterly dependent on their employers, whose fortunes in the 1930s were conspicuously fickle. But executives were able to thrive on their own. Grant claimed his own career exemplified this truth. Nobody stopped me as an independent. 
but it wasn't just selling where this way of thinking flourished. The direct selling industry was able to grow at an unparalleled rate in the 30s, in part because the depression created a virtually inexhaustible labor supply for its firms. Direct selling required no formal training or certification. Customers could be found anywhere. And the work itself was flexible and easily performed part-time or while searching for other long-term employment. But these perks were not confined exclusively to participation in corporate direct selling schemes such as Avon. Throughout the 30s, the swollen army of the unemployed turned in increasing numbers to odd jobs ad hoc service work done on an informal or short-term basis for another individual or small business. Workers used odd jobs to augment their income or even in the best case scenario, to reestablish their careers. Odd jobs had much in common with direct selling. They demanded interpersonal skill and the exercise of individual initiative. It required a relatively small amount of money to change hands per transaction, which was the boom in the depression. It typically relied on acts of salesmanship which odd job seekers created demand for their services, if not for a tangible product. And they represented a form of work done for another person that nonetheless did not count as formal employment for the purposes of federal labor law. And like direct selling, odd jobbery was a very old form of work that, due to its apparent imperviousness to the Depression, came to seem innovative, entrepreneurial in the 1930s. Indeed, the concept of odd jobs became central to the conservative approach to the issue of unemployment relief in the 30s, which rejected federal deficit spending and the direct job creation of the Works Progress Administration in favor of moral suasion aimed at both prospective employers and job seekers alike. There's one very good way in which the public generally can do its bit towards relieving the unemployment condition, wrote Republican Senator Arthur Capper, chairman of the District of Columbia Committee, in a, in a 1932 appeal to Washington home and business owners. If you have an odd job that should be done, let it be done now when the need for work is greatest, Kappa wrote. State and local unemployment bureaucracies, often young and underfunded, especially before the advent of the New Deal, echoed calls like Kappa's less out of ideological compunction and as a matter of expediency in the face of budget constraint. But the odd or temporary job has proved to be, oops, the odd or temporary job has proved to be a real relief, noted New York City Free Employment Bureau Director Edward Rubitsky in 1931. He called on homeowners, quote, employ the jobless immediately for cleaning and renovating instead of waiting until spring, according to the New York Times, and urged corporations to do their best to discover temporary work that could be given to office workers. Unemployment, such pleas suggested, was less a symptom of a structural crisis in American capitalism and more an unfortunate consequence of middle class miserliness. Unemployment relief prescriptions frequently went one step further and placed the onus for creating odd jobs on jobless individuals rather than on the property classes. In the aftermath of the recession of 1937 to 1938, that was kind of blurry, the Duluth Junior Chamber of Commerce held a four-day job creators congress responding to reports that the city had the nation's highest per capita unemployment relief cost. Reflecting the close association between the concept of job creation and the new thought movement in the early 20th century, the official theme of the congress was think your way to a job. Unemployed workers were invited to bring samples of crafting or tinkering they'd done at home for the purpose of soliciting customers and investors. One home's craftsman, the nation's business breathlessly reported, met with such enthusiasm that he, quote, was forced to turn his home into a small factory with five full-time employees. Observers in the 30s often contrasted such authentically self-made jobs with the meretricious jobs created on behalf of the unemployed by the government or by charitable private citizens. Talking to the Washington Post in 1933, about a group of unemployed women who had, quote, made jobs for themselves doing clerical work at a local botanical garden, the garden's director emphasized that they had done productive, not created work of the highest type. This work, he said, increased the efficiency, not only of our own staff, but that of scientific investigators visiting the garden. The genuinely productive or efficiency enhancing character of the work then seemed intrinsically related to the fact that the women had acted creatively and made it themselves rather than having it provided or created for them by someone else. The idea that the source of work was relevant in assessing its value reflected the extent to which the entrepreneurial work ethic had already become intuitive for many Americans before the start of the Depression. Hundreds of you are out of jobs because you're too unadaptable, the writer and Columbia professor Walter Pitkin chastised good housekeeping readers in 1934. You've been duped by the adage, keeping ever everlastingly at it brings success. So here you can really see Horatio Alger was dead. Work ethic that emphasized industrious perseverance had little to say 
about long-term unemployment on the scale witnessed in the depths of the depression. Success in the modern economy demanded a different set of qualities, not only attention, concentration, and persistence, but also versatility of interests and skills, adaptability in strange new situations, and in general, the ability to adjust easily to fast and constant change. All of these virtues ultimately amounted, Pick and argued, to the ability to be your own boss. Those who, who succeeded in developing an entrepreneurial consciousness, who did not, quote, need to be told what to do, were those who would be able to beat the odds and thrive no matter the state of the economy as a whole. Unfortunately, few schools teach this art, Pick and warned, but there are good books covering it pretty well. There were indeed. Their foremost number was a manual that appeared in 1933 titled Make Your Own Job, Opportunities in Unusual Vocations. Its authors, Violet Ryder and H.B. Doust in Boston, were obscure figures when they wrote the book and remained obscure after its publication. I have not been able to find a photo of either of them. But their text struck a nerve. It was widely reviewed, recommended in the press, and appeared in contemporary bibliographies on the practice of vocational guidance. And the titular slogan, although by no means their coinage, expanded its circulation in the American vernacular after the book appeared in print. The book deployed the notion of unusual vocations to bestow the dignity of entrepreneurship onto the odd job. The person who pursued an unusual vocation was not merely performing menial work on another's behalf. Rather, if he understood the situation properly, he was in the midst of establishing a small one-man business of his own. Success in this enterprise required not merely persistence, but also the recasting of old habits into new molds. It required workers not only to identify, but to create consumer demand, though on the model of the salesperson as opposed to the Keynesian policymaker. But humanity has many needs, some of which it has not even recognized, awaiting the enterprising individual to turn them to his profit, Ryder and Daust wrote. The quirkiness of the examples of own job creation compiled in the book testified to the importance of ingenuity and creativity in the process of becoming one's own boss. The unemployed, Ryder and Daust documented, had gotten themselves back on their feet by making birdhouses, reading tea leaves, performing genealogical research, knitting koozies for baby bottles, and even breeding tropical fish. If opportunity seemed scarce, they insisted it was only because Americans had grown unaccustomed to thinking outside the box. The idea that unusualness was an important entrepreneurial asset anchored make-your-own-jobs appeals aimed at populations marginalized in the industrial labor market. Middle-aged women were an especially prominent target. It was precisely because they faced hiring discrimination that women over 40 who are suddenly thrown on their resources ought to seek to establish yourself in a business of your own instead of hunting a job which you may never land. According to a Washington Post summary of a 1937 lecture sponsored by the National Federation of Business and Professional Women. By focusing on the so-called women's fields, food, shelter, clothing, childcare, et cetera, and especially on fields where maturity is an asset rather than a liability, older women could steer away from the more crowded competitive fields and make their own jobs. The independent women agreed. There were, quote, many jobs the middle-aged woman fond of children can make for herself, not despite, but because of the depression, since community mothers are an inevitability in an age when children's own mothers must go to business to help keep the home fires burning. As always in the world of success literature, exemplars were invaluable. The advice writers Clarabelle Thompson and Margaret Luke Wise were the two middle figures there, boasted in the title of their 1938 book, we are 40 and we did get jobs. They addressed older men as well as women who often found themselves disadvantaged in workplaces without union back seniority arrangements. A 52 year old man named Anthony reported to Thompson and Wise that after he was laid off from his job at a department store, I got a job by hiring myself. He began contracting with doctors to write personalized collection notes to delinquent patients. Anthony's magic touch apparently so improved payment rates that he soon had more than 30 clients. Such parables, Thompson and Wise argued, exemplified the basic rule of rules for creating one's own job, telling the employer how you can be valuable to him instead of asking him what he can do to you. As the new thought writers had argued around the turn of the century, modern success was less about discharging one's assigned duties diligently and more a matter of selling oneself, developing one's talents and passions into an income stream. These echoes of new thought helped to underpin the appeal of the gospel of odd jobs and unusual vocations in urban black communities during the depression. 
After a brief lull following Marcus Garvey's incarceration and deportation in the 20s, Black New Thought experienced significant resurgence in the 1930s. Preachers such as James F. Jones, Elder Lightfoot Solomon Michaud, and above all, the charismatic Harlem spiritual leader, Father Divine, proselytized on behalf of the power of positive thinking. Father Divine told his congregates that contemporary racial inequality was by and large the consequence of Black Americans' sustained belief that their race placed them at a disadvantage. Imbued with this negative mindset, they would find discrimination everywhere they went, but in reality, quote, they and no one else would be responsible. Recognizing that racism was a mental illusion, he argued, would allow his congregants to break out of their self-defeating thought patterns and attain the kind of prosperity he himself enjoyed, as he demonstrated daily at his lavish peace mission banquets, which fed thousands of Parlamites. Some Black self-help writers argued that prospective Black entrepreneurs actually enjoyed unique opportunities in the present day compared to their white competitors precisely because of their marginality. In the, quote, creative field of job making, the colored young man or woman for once has the advantage over his white brother or sister, argued the Baltimore Afro-American in 1932. There are thousands of possible jobs which young colored men and women can create in their own group, which have already been created and filled in the white group. If only the black unemployed would look around them, they will see many opportunities to make their own jobs. From one perspective, these opportunities looked like lowly odd jobs. One young woman made $6 every Saturday baking and delivering to a group of regular customers a special homemade cake. Nonetheless, such unusual advantages, unusual vocations enjoyed a unique set of advantages. They were not merely more resilient to the depression, as Ryder and Doust had argued, but relatively impervious to racist discrimination. White racism could not prevent a young black woman from selling cakes on a subscription basis to other black people in her community. Making one's own job for black Americans was not merely a survival strategy, but a way of declaring independence from an industrial labor market dominated by white capitalists. For this reason, political radicalism co coexisted with conservatism in the depression era black self-help movement to an unusual extent, just as in the Garveyite milieu of the 1910s and early 1920s. The Afro-Americans brief for making one's own job actually appeared in the same column as an endorsement of the Communist Party's 1932 presidential ticket, comprising the white labor organizer William Z. Foster and the black activist James W. Ford. This will go down as the first serious gesture uh, of any political party of worldwide importance to place a colored man on the ticket as vice president, the paper wrote. Even Father Divine made significant overtures to the CPUSA, declaring in a 1936 convention of his movement's political arm, the communist ideas must be endorsed, at least some of them. At the day of Pentecost, they had many things in common, did they not? James Ford actually was in attendance at that speech as an official Communist Party emissary. For ordinary Black Americans who face no compulsion to ideological purity, it was possible to accept the entrepreneurial work ethic as a program for individual success in the short term, while still looking to revolutionary socialism to bring collective liberation in the long term. These potentially explosive contradictions were entirely absent from the top-selling self-help books of the Depression era, which addressed a white middle-class audience. The vast majority of these readers remained employed even in the worst moments of the Depression, but in absolute terms, professional class unemployment reached previously unimaginable heights, and the specter of downward mobility was ubiquitous. For readers afflicted by what Barbara Ehrenreich describes as the middle class's fear of falling, the entrepreneurial work ethic functioned as a sort of insurance policy, not just a fail-safe strategy in cases of unemployment, but a preemptive ward against redundancy and obsolescence. Quote, business ages most men rapidly, one 1934 advice manual warned, its victims soon find themselves superannuated. Only, quote, the man who makes a job for himself could stay forever young. Perseverance, mere hard work was no longer sufficient to guarantee success. The turbulence of the modern economy imposed a new set of injunctions. Experiment, be original, try to create. Don't allow your brains to ossify and your arteries to harden. This success blueprint was the essence of the secularized new thought that pervaded early 20th century advice writing a style which received a new jolt of life during the Depression. Perhaps the most orthodox new thinker of this cohort was Napoleon Hill, who rose from Appalachian poverty to the sort of opulence that it was still possible for best-selling authors to enjoy in the 1930s. Hill was a con man. He spent much of the early 20th century on the run from the authorities of various states throughout the country as one scheme after another fell apart, including a fraudulent lumber mill, 
a college that illegally extracted unpaid labor assembling automobiles from its students, a stock market scam tied to a semi-fictitious Chicago advertising institute, and a series of magazines that served as a front to launder money intended for World War I's veterans charity into yet another stock market scam. It was this, in this era, uncoincidentally, that he changed his first name from Oliver to Napoleon. Hill's greatest con was his fabrication of a relationship with Andrew Carnegie, who Hill claimed had disclosed the secret of success to him in a private meeting in 1908 that almost certainly did not take place. The law of success Hill allegedly learned from Carnegie was more or less indistinguishable from the new thought success philosophy expanded in that decade by, among others, Orson Sweat Martin, who ran that success magazine, and Ralph Waldo Trine. But despite, or perhaps because of its familiarity, readers purchased Hill's first book in 1928 in surprising quantities, considering that it was an eight volume collection of Hill's previously published self-help pamphlets. The book that made Hill's fortune appeared in 1937 under the irresistible title, Think and Grow Rich. This slogan has undoubtedly fed the misconception that new thought and its descendants comprised an anti-work ethic, a pathway to wealth that used a kind of magic to skirt the need for concerted effort. On the contrary, Hill explicitly endorsed old-fashioned persistence as one of the indispensable steps to riches, and even insisted under the aegis of what he called sex transmutation on the need for success seekers to sublimate their erotic energy into their work. Think and Grow Rich prescribed a work ethic, but like New Thought, more generally, it was entrepreneurial rather than industrious in character. Perseverance and sublimation were necessary but insufficient. The striver also needed specialized knowledge, the foundation of the service, merchandise, or profession which you intend to offer in return for fortune. Earlier New Thought writers had also argued, in a somewhat more mystical register, that success rested not on the individual's willingly, willingness to dutifully perform the tasks they were assigned, but to identify some personal capacity within themselves that they were able to sell in the market. In the era of odd jobs and unusual vocations, the pragmatic implications of this recommended mindset shift were clearer than ever before. Quote, with the changed conditions ushered in by the world economic collapse came also the need for newer and better ways of marketing personal services, Hill wrote. Not that Hill dispensed with the mystical entirely. Cultivating a self that was worth selling, he explained, required imagination, which in turn was the source of ideas, a word Hill almost always rendered in all caps to emphasize its quasi-supernatural valence. The brain was both a broadcasting and a receiving station for the vibration of thought. If one's inner antenna was tuned properly, one could pick up on an idea that was, quote, capable of yielding an income far greater than that of the average doctor, lawyer, or engineer whose education required several years in college. Resolutely populist in style, Hill insisted that Henry Ford and Thomas Edison were better equipped with specialized knowledge and ideas in his sense than their apparently more erudite college-educated professional contemporaries. Rapidly changing industrial mature capitalism did require mental work to navigate, Hill argued, but it had to be approached in an entrepreneurial rather than bureaucratic spirit, practical and transactional rather than abstract and systematic. For professionals experiencing an acute sense of precariousness during the depression, uh, in many cases for the first time in their careers, this message was both challenging and attractive, especially when dispensed by a spokesman like Hill. Even his most ardent detractors had to admit, after all, that Hill's considerable powers of imagination were no small part of his success. Dale Carnegie, the most influential self-help writer of the 1930s by far, expounded a new thought-inspired success philosophy that was even more thoroughly secularized than Hill's. One did not have to be willing to accept the metaphysics of thought vibrations to become a disciple of Carnegie. Even though Carnegie's embrace of new thought was reasonably wholehearted as a young man, recently arrived in New York from Missouri and still spelling his surname Carnegie, which you can't see because of the caption, but it's, that's how he signs it. When the rebranded Dale Carnegie finally broke through into superstardom in the 30s, he had adopted a more ecumenical style. The mature Carnegie's new thought was not merely secularized, but gentrified. As the writer and actor Lowell Thomas explained in the preface to How to Win Friends and Influence People, Carnegie's career-making 1936 book, Carnegie advertised his lectures not in a tabloid sheet, but in the most conservative evening paper in town. And his core audience was, quote, of the upper economic strata, executives, employers, and professional men. While the core audience of early 20th century New Thought was the provincial petit bourgeoisie from which Carnegie himself hailed, Carnegie managed to produce a corpus of success writing that was borderline middle brow. To this end, Carnegie augmented his New Thought foundations with ideas and concepts drawn from the world of academic management theory. 
The full name of his business organization, in fact, was the Dale Carnegie Institute of Effective Speaking and Human Relations, alluding to the dominant paradigm of management thought at Harvard Business School at the time. The Carnegie Institute's sales pitch read, increase your income, learn to speak effectively, prepare for leadership. Like the Harvard human relations theorists, Carnegie understood leadership as a sort of subjectivity. Carnegie maintained that he was not advocating a bag of tricks, but rather talking about a new way of life, a way of being a person, and more particularly, a way of being a man. Indeed, Carnegie promised that his principles would solve his readers' work problems and marital problems simultaneously. Whether supplying homespun wisdom about employees or wives, Carnegie drew a seductive parallelism between all the important people in a middle-class man's life. They were all creatures driven primarily by a profound need for his interest, affection, and care. These were gifts that any man could supply if he looked deep enough within himself and realized his potential as a leader. You who are reading these lines possess powers of various sorts which you habitually fail to use, Carnegie announced. And one of those powers, which you are probably not using to the fullest extent, is your magic ability to praise people and inspire them with a realization of their latent possibilities. As this invocation of latent possibility suggests, Carnegie recognized that the human relations model of leadership ultimately depended on an entrepreneurial conception of the successful worker. What made a manager a leader as opposed to a bureaucrat was his ability to inspire his subordinates to exercise initiative and creativity rather than relying on him for precise instructions. Quote, folks who never do any more than they are paid for never get paid for any more than they do. Carnegie proclaimed in the advice column he wrote for the Washington Post in the wake of How to Win Friends. For this reason, diligence was less important to success than passion. Everywhere we turn, there is evidence of success following the person who likes his work, Carnegie wrote. The task of the manager then was to get employees to like their work, which in turn required him to bring his own personality to the workplace, to display an infectious enthusiasm for the mission of the firm. The entrepreneurial work ethic was a one-size-fits-all prescription good for managers as well as employees. This protean character helped Carnegie to sell an enormous number of books. No matter where a person stood on the occupational ladder, they could feel that Carnegie was somehow speaking directly to them. Carnegie was personally conservative. He was disinterested in reform and untroubled by inequality, believing that the wealthy generally deserved their wealth. And he had a palpable admiration for the United States business executives. But he was not much of a partisan political actor, especially at the height of his fame in the 30s. His single-minded enthusiasm for power and status precluded it. He admired Franklin Roosevelt for the same reason he admired anyone. He was successful. And Carnegie was constitutionally incapable of turning down an opportunity to rub elbows with famous and influential people, even if he didn't share their politics. Carnegie's friend and fellow New Thought evangelist Norman Vincent Peale, the senior minister of Marble Collegiate Church in Manhattan, took his ideological commitments more seriously. I'd like to end by talking in some detail about Peale and his politics, uh, because he's really quite an important figure. He became world famous after the publication of The Power of Positive Thinking in 1952. Uh, he lived long enough to officiate the first wedding of the son of his friend, the real estate mogul Fred Trump, in 1977. But he first came to prominence in the 1930s and early 1940s as something of a New York celebrity. Simultaneously, a purveyor of depression-busting self-help advice and a vicious opponent of the New Deal. The New York Times regularly reported on Peel's sermons even when their content was utterly anodyne. One headline read simply, Peel sees greatness in humans. To be fair, Peel's sermons were often legitimately newsworthy political events. Peel railed from the pulpit against Roosevelt, whom he called an affront against the American people, against the labor movement, which was allegedly exploited by subversive elements, by fascist and communist influences, and against secularism, since the US was a religious country at heart. His behind the scenes political activity was just as significant He's a close friend of James W. Fifield Jr., the Los Angeles-based minister who founded the organization Spiritual Mobilization in 1935 to rally Christian opposition to the New Deal. Peel served on the organization's advisory committee into the 50s. In 1938, Peel appeared at a pro-America rally alongside the Reverend Edward Lodge Curran, a far-right backer of Francisco Franco and the anti-Semitic radio priest Charles Coughlin, a decision which Peel later described as, quote, a mistake. His self-help books were the only context in which Peel kept relatively quiet about his political commitments, though it was not difficult to read between the lines. Peel's philosophy was explicitly Christian in a way that New Thought often was not, but Peel strongly encouraged its core themes, the primacy of thought over matter, the power of intention, 
and the ability of individuals through proper mental and spiritual hygiene to channel an infinitely powerful reservoir of creative cosmic energy. Peel also followed the New Thought template in deliberately blurring the boundary between theology and scientific psychology. In 1937, Peel established a religio-psychiatric clinic at his church in Manhattan with the psychiatrist Smiley Blanton, who had undergone a training analysis with Sigmund Freud himself. Blanton was a devout Christian and embraced Peel's conviction that religion and psychoanalysis were complementary resources that ought to be brought to bear together on the psychic suffering unleashed by the Depression. Peel's most popular book before The Power of Positive Thinking was his 1941 collaboration with Blanton, Faith is the Answer, a psychiatrist and a pastor discuss your problems. The problems in question were wide ranging, including marital discord, feelings of anxiety and depression, alcoholism, and career troubles. In all cases, the diagnosis and the prescription were identical. The individual had adopted a fearful, self-recriminating attitude, lost touch with their inner potential, and set themselves up to fail. That they can ameliorate every unhappiness at once by adopting an attitude of faith and receptivity to divine energy. Peel weighed in on the issue of success at work more explicitly in his other Depression-era self-help books, The Art of Living in 1937 and You Can Win in 1938. Peel explained that successful workers were those who cultivated a positive attitude and trusted in God and themselves. Warriors and those who strained to force themselves to work would inevitably crumble physically and mentally from the strain. Peel praised the example of a surgeon he knew who worked, quote, hard enough to break down three ordinary men, but who was buoyed by his sense of joy in living and his mastery of mental exercises that helped him continually rep replenish his energy. Like his New Thought predecessors, Peel prescribed a work ethic of sorts. Good hard work is one of man's greatest boons, and a lazy man is to be abhorred. But he denounced by name the 19th century work ethic associated with Horatio Alger. But perhaps we will succeed better if we strive less, or at the very least reduce the tension of our effort, he wrote. A self-punishing ethos of striving, in Peel's view, severed the individual from the ultimate success, source of success in the modern world not sheer effort, but creativity. The positive thinker, he wrote, was able to realize that we are in God in a continuous creative process, and thus to channel that creative power in his own activity. Successful work was motivated by pleasure in the work itself, rather than a sense of obligation or hope for future rewards. Peel opposed the New Deal precisely because he thought its social security programs were fostering an instrumentalist, worry-laden approach to work. A hotel executive who had invited Peel to address his employees complained that the workers he encountered were, quote, more anxious to get away from the job than to do the job well, and indeed seemed perfectly contented with their lot in life as long as they get enough to support themselves and go to the movies and a dance now and then. Peel found this report corroborated by his experience helping an unemployed parishioner to find a job. Peel reported that the parishioner declined the opportunity Peel had obtained for him reasoning that he could get about as much on relief without working for it. If the state succeeded in ensuring that even those who refused to work could still eat and find shelter, the consequence would be a nation that would never know the meaning and deep satisfaction of achievement won by man-sized effort and skill. Though Peel did not reference Roosevelt or the New Deal by name, the target of his criticism was unmistakable, especially to those who listened regularly to his sermons. On strictly logical grounds, Peel's complaint was utterly incoherent. If worry was the enemy, how could it be a problem if the welfare state reduced or eliminated the risk of total destitution? After all, Roosevelt himself famously justified the aggressive reforms of the early New Deal period on the grounds that the only thing to fear was fear itself. But Peel maintained that the sense of security fostered by the welfare state was spiritually inauthentic. It did not require a radical act of faith in God, only a rational, cold-blooded calculation of one's likely material prospects under the existing policy regime. Hence why it supposedly encouraged idleness rather than liberating individuals to embrace joyfully the intrinsic rewards of creative work. In this respect, Peel did not only offer a roadmap to success, but sought subtly to redefine its meaning, not the state of material well-being of the sort that could hypothetically be guaranteed universally by redistributivist economic policy, but rather a sense of union with the divine energy that bubbled beneath the illusory surfaces of the world. The secret of Peel's philosophy was that it rested on a subtle tautology. The right attitude led to success because true success, as he understood it, just was having the right attitude. Peel, in his own way, imagined Sisyphus happy. That was a reassuring thought in the depths of the Depression, which is the principal reason for Peel's own success in the more pecuniary sense of the word. 
It was even separable in the abstract from Peel's conclusions about electoral politics. Roosevelt builders, as well as conservative Republicans, were capable of embracing the power of positive thinking. But Peel's redefinition of success was a matter of addition as well as subtraction. If it decoupled success from material reward, at least in theory, it also stigmatized dependence as a marker of failure ipso facto. The person who evinced no interest in making their own job, preferring instead to accept government relief or a WPA job, or even simply an undemanding private sector job where they could clock in, clock out, and go to the movies, appeared in the self-help worldview as a vortex of entitlement and faithlessness. It was possible for an individual to flourish only through work they had somehow cathected with cosmic creativity, a sentiment that was absorbed only implicitly by many self-help readers in the 1930s ultimately proved far more effective in checking the ambitions of New Deal era reformers than any of Peel's more forthright polemics. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Eric. Wow. Um, I have loads of questions, um, but I'll start with one and we'll see how it goes. Um, I was struck um, listening to your talk by the extent to which um, the entrepreneurial work ethic is a racialized condition. And I know you gave us a moment with Father Divine and sort of the entrepreneurial ethic in black spaces, but it's also striking how uh, how white the entrepreneurial work ethic is. Like the Avon ladies, it's just a portrait of whiteness. And especially when you were talking about the odd jobs movement, it's, it's, it sort of struck me that um, it seemed like what was being advocated for was um, a displacement of traditional black labor in the home with what I'm assuming were white people. Um, so do you wanna talk about um, the extent to which entrepreneurial work ethic is a is a condition of whiteness. Yeah, I think that the way. Oh to, wait, sorry, you have to. Uh, it's a great question. I think that the way to to kind of square this this tension, where on the one hand there's a real embrace in the circle around Father Divine earlier, and uh, the circle around Marcus Garvey and, and Booker T. Washington, um, with the the clear whiteness of, I mean, especially the, the mainstream self help literature at the end. Um, is that this is the in part a response to the decay of the system of racialized labor market segmentation that had developed in the Gilded Age, um, where you had uh, the, the sort of normative job in the late 19th century um, in full time industrial employment. Um, you see the beginnings of uh, the modern industrial union movement and um, to a certain extent, even collective bargaining. Um, you know, th this is very much a, a, a privilege of whiteness and black work in the industrial economy um, often takes the form of workers brought in on a much more informal, unprotected, ad hoc basis, often um, to, you know, explicitly to kind of foster division, undercut um, the, the, the sort of power of, of workers who are making a claim to, on the basis of their whiteness, to. Um, certain sort of benefits from um, from their employer. And David Rediger in Elizabeth Esch's book, uh, The Production of, of Difference, is very good on this period. So that really begins to uh, be jeopardized by the, the, the stagnation and then eventually the decline of um, exactly that kind of, uh, you know, classic industrial uh, employment, and especially in the Great Depression. I mean, so many of those jobs just instantly vanish. So I think that there, the, the distinction here is that you have, on the one hand, um, you have a, a, a strand of, of thinking uh, of, of entrepreneurialism that has appealed to people who are never part of that world. Uh, and, and then you have a, a somewhat different, but you know, very much related articulation of many of the same ideas um, that have appealed to people in a more defensive way. It's a way to, it's a way to keep up one's, one's status. Again, I think that there's a, there's a sort of racialized version of the, the sort of middle class fear of falling um, in Barbara Ehrenreich's words that um, that also kind of explains the, the psychology of the, the appeal of entrepreneurialism to white folks. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. It was fascinating. Um, I raised my hand quickly because I have to go in 15 minutes, but I, I definitely wanted to ask you, I hope two questions. The first one is um, about the fascinating relationship between the work ethic that you describe and a, a certain type of health ethic, it seems, um, you know, the notion that you described that um, the notion that self, the self-employed will be more energetic or healthy or younger. I can't remember exactly the terminology, but it strikes me as fascinating in part because it, it seems like it's a predecessor to the current moment where there is complete overlap between the terminology of both. And I wondered if you could offer some thoughts about, about that in particular, you know, I'm thinking of no pain, no gain and fi fall five times, stand up six times. It seems like the, the vocabulary of the entrepreneurial, the late entrepreneurial work ethic, I don't know how one might call it, and and health, um, that there's a convergence there and, and that I could see it a little bit in your talk. So any thought, uh, um, I thought it was really interesting. The second thing I wanted to ask you about is more specific. It's where the, the affect of the small business owner fits into this. Uh, it seems today, you know, as a foreigner in America, that this, it's the locus classicus of the American middle class. And um, and I wonder if it, it, it comes up somewhere in between the, the industry or company men or, and, and the self-employed, if there is a moment where the small company in particular emerges as, a, as something that is relevant. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, both really terrific questions. Um, yeah, the, the, the health, that intertwining of, of, of health and career success, I mean, in some ways really is the, the quintessential uh, innovation, so to speak, of, of new thought, um, which begins as a, as a kind of faith healing movement. I mean, it, it's, uh, historians often think about new thought as first a kind of splinter movement from Christian science that then kind of a, takes on a life of its own. Um, so a lot of the the earliest new thought writers of the, the 1880s, to a certain extent, the early 1890s, were primarily concerned with with health, um, with the issue of of spiritual healing, uh, the importance of mind over recognizing that illness was a was a kind of mental illusion, um, and it really is a it's a different a, a, a second generation of of new thought writers in the 1890s and, and 19 aughts who um, kind of take over the movement and, and really re-gear it towards emphasizing um, success and work, but the, the two remain um, very closely related. Um, and it's it's central, I mean, especially in, in Peel, you really see this idea that, you know, we're not going to be sort of these kind of classic Weberian, self-punishing, self-restraining strivers, um, but instead we're going to be, we're going to let the creative energy of the world flow through us, but still work hard. I mean, this is the, and I think this is often what gets lost. A lot of historians sort of see, you know, new thought is marking the, the end of the work ethic uh, for this reason, but it's, you know, quite clear, I think, in, in Peel that it's, it's, it's a vision of, of part of the health that he's envisioning is a, a healthy relationship to work, which may, in, in other contexts, or maybe from our perspective, has sort of pathologies on its own. Um, as far as the question of the small business owner, I mean, it's so much in the background of this. Um, again, I mean, especially for for professional employees, um, you know, what's what's interesting about this uh, that well, one of the things that's interesting about this discourse is the way that it interpolates, you could say, wage workers, you know, people who would think of themselves as members of the working class, as well as people who would never think of themselves in those terms, um, who think of themselves as as middle class professionals. Um, and uh, a lot, it, I mean, a, a little less so by the 1930s, certainly a bit earlier in the 20th century, the vast majority of those people's parents, um, you know, their, their fathers in particular would have been owners of, of a small business, even if they were in professions, they would have been organized on a, a kind of independent proprietor model. Um, and it's the disappearance of that world around the turn of the 20th century that, um, in some sense creates the, it, it creates the set of anxieties to which this is a response. You know, is it possible to still have the kind of, you know, subjectivity, you know, moral resources of an independent proprietor while working as a corporate employee? Um, that's a question that achieves great salience. Later in the 20th century, uh, those corporations, rather than just sort of 
encouraging this as a, as a kind of um, way of thinking about oneself, um, they re, they, there are various kinds of, this is kind of where the management consulting side of the story comes into place. Um, increasingly, those workforces actually get reorganized on the kind of independent contractor model that, that comes out of direct selling. So now you have, you know, people who are, um, you know, attorneys or, you know, media professionals, whatever, um, content creators who are, who are independent contractors, you know, in the same way as the, the, the Avon women. And so this, you know, is, is that shift is ce certainly celebrated as a, a kind of return to almost a kind of like Hegelian sort of reconstitution on a higher level of like 19th century small business. We passed through the corporation and now we have like a better kind of small business culture. Uh, and that's certainly very, you know, again, in the late 20th century, there's another period of economic crisis, unemployment, surplus labor. And um, it's a very similar story, this, this idea of, you know, the, the small business owner, um, you know, creating the job for oneself as a sort of palliative for, for unemployment um, kind of comes back into, into vogue. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. A uh, three quick points. Capra, what 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 state was a senator from? And then you might have Capra. You mentioned him <clears throat> worked in the in the district. What state was he from? Uh, I believe he was from Kentucky. Oh, interesting. Now you might know Ma Maggie Garb. The work of Maggie Garb. Sadly, she was a, a graduate student here in my time. She sadly passed away. Um, she wrote uh, research about the emergence of the move from entrepreneurs to, to people who are more in business. And of course, looking at entrepreneurs in a much more positive way than, than those who are only managing it. So somebody that you uh, think that goes well. And last but not least, I think that your work wonderfully corrects what empty shells is trying to do uh, in terms of uh, in interpreting the New Deal, if you can comment on that. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Um, the... I think that, you know, this is often the sort of narrative of the of 20th century capitalism economic culture, passage from the entrepreneurial to the managerial. Um, and I think this is basically wrong. I mean, there's there's clearly a germ of truth there. The rise of corporations, the organization of, of a bureaucratic um, workforce. But the, you know, people in the 19th century are not calling themselves entrepreneurs. The, this concept really comes into fashion. I mean, it's even... The, the word itself is is not widely used, but really until the, the publication of Joseph Schumpeter's Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy in the early 40s, um, which sort of takes it out of the, the economics discipline. Um, you know, this is a concept, this is an identity that it's that it's that is is new. I mean, it's it's reactionary in a sense, it's it's looking back to a previous time, but it is new. You know, you don't think of yourself, you know, if you're if you own a small shop somewhere. Um, in the 1870s, you don't think of yourself as entrepreneurial in the way that someone might in the 1930s, because that's, that's just how the economy works. I mean, there's nothing special about it. Um, the, the, the rise of entrepreneurialism is a distinctly 20th century modern phenomenon because there's something, there's something to define it in contrast to. It becomes a way of navigating these bureaucratic places. Earlier in the book, I talk about you know, a lot of people you know the irony is is that if you if you get out of the textbooks and you actually look at what these big bureaucratic offices looked like, they were not very regimented at all. They were extremely confusing and chaotic. I mean, we all know this. <laughs> you know, we've been in bureaucratic workplaces where it's not obvious what you're supposed to do, and so this argument is made very explicitly in in self self help books aimed at um, you know workers in in big offices. This phrase "make your own job" really comes into to currency as a it's a survival strategy within the, the chaos of, of modern bureaucracy. Um, so I think that the way that we've that we've periodized this as a profession, I mean, going back to the 1970s in, in, in US history is, is a little too kind of social theory schematic in terms of, as opposed to, you know, looking at the more in the cultural and social life of, of working people in these in these environments. Um, in terms of in terms of the New Deal, I mean there's there's so you know, in the in the abstract that I sent in, I kind of framed um, the this presentation as a, a kind of different answer to the question of why didn't the New Deal do more? 
um, you know, why did this sort of moment of radical possibility, um, you know, sort of evanesce? Um, and, you know, the, I, I don't think that there is one answer to the, this question and the, the kind of the, the more familiar explanations in terms of um, the Democratic Party's reliance on Southern segregationists, um, the kind of ambivalence of Roosevelt himself about a lot of these questions, um, you know, all, all of that is, is extremely significant. But I do think also that this, you know, the, this distinction, you know, that this botanical garden director guy draws between a productive and a created job. I mean, this is a, you know, he's, he's clearly speaking a kind of vernacular language here. And I just think it's, it's tremendously important to, to understand the purchase of, of that concept and, and the, the, the fact that, you know, there, there's, there is the development of a kind of stigma emerging, um, not even just from partisan political actors, but as a, as a kind of, you know, part of vernacular economic culture that, um, that stigmatizes so-called created jobs, you know, jobs created on someone else's behalf as opposed to created by oneself. You know, this, this distinction um, has a, an enormous, um, enormous significance in terms of how people are able to relate to the kinds of opportunities that New Deal reformers are presenting to them. Do, do, you, do you think that, are you able to feel proud of yourself working in a WPA job? You know, this is, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, people like myself who admire programs like the WPA, we don't even want to countenance the possibility that the answer to that question might have been no. But as a matter of historical fact, I think that those, those cultural attitudes are important to understand. Um, thanks, Ike. This was a really fascinating talk and um, many questions and thoughts. But one I wanted to ask about was a bit about the, um, and I think it builds a little on the, the um, question about small business owners, but um, sort of what the relationship of these, what seem to be like odd, unusual, like around the margins or sort of attempts to, to sort of develop these creative and, and sort of um, unusual, quirky, you know, these kinds of terms that come up again and again in, in contrast to like the industrial workplace um, jobs and, and sort of fill in gaps or something in the in the um, in the capitalist economy. Um, how this how this like relates to and um, I guess or whether there's an aspiration for these to eventually become <laughs> sort of like at the center of you know um, like a, a, not even just small businesses but large businesses right like the entrepreneur who maybe starts off as like self-created jobs, but then, you know, you talked about the, the person who turn, is forced to turn the home into a factory um, who has like five employees, right? And then presumably for a lot of these people, the aspiration is maybe to then have 50 employees and then like 500 and, you know, to sort of build like the, um, to be at the head of the, the sort of um, large industrial workforce um, staffed by, uh, you know, a bunch of sort of traditional employees. And so I guess I'm just like curious if that is an aspiration or, or if that's something that I'm projecting onto it from based on thinking about like contemporary entrepreneurial yeah. culture where like you, you grow the big business. Um, and, and then I think like how that this kind of um, model and, and like idea of oneself and subjectivity, um, like the tensions that might emerge if you're, you know, on the one hand you talked about with the self-help culture, like this idea that um, you want to inspire others to creativity instead of just like giving them instructions, but presumably you also want them to do what you want them to, right? Like if you're employing people, the classic kind of like, um, uh, you know, desire of the boss for control over the workers. And so I'm just curious how these sort of, um, these, these this, this sort of impulse of creativity and, and like um, uh, uh, creating these sort of things for oneself um, uh, relates to what might be a, a desire to eventually have a bunch of people who are doing what you ask them to do. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, really terrific and, and important questions. Um, absolutely, the, the aspiration is is to become a, a big boss. Um, I mean, the one again, one sort of irony in the the periodization schemes that have emerged is, you know, we, we think of Fordism as a kind of shorthand for you know the old school big bureaucratic uh, managerial capitalism, but Henry Ford is, I mean, and Napoleon Hill's writing elsewhere. I mean, he is the icon of, of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurialism. Um, he's closely associated with the new thought movement. Um, you know, he, and, and he, the, the fact that there are these people working at assembly lines, uh, underneath him. I mean, this is, this is not, this is not material to his conception of himself. In fact, he feels quite bad about it in some ways and, and goes to great lengths to kind of, preserve in this weird way in his museum and in Dearborn, the like vestiges of, of old, an older pattern of American life. 
so yeah, I mean, people, you know, the, the, the dream is definitely you, you start off, you know, you're this, this guy, Anthony, who's like writing, you know, uh, personalized collection notes, um, for doctors, you know, your, your hope is that eventually you, you know, grow this into a big business where you have people, you know, employees who are doing that for hundreds of doctors. Um, but the, 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 the tension that this creates is, I, I think, absolutely spot on. And this is the central, this is a, another chapter of the book discusses the, the Harvard Business School management intellectuals at this time. And this is what they're preoccupied with. I mean, exactly this question, how to, how to manage, what, you know, what does this kind of philosophy of entrepreneurialism they take up? I mean, Joseph Schumpeter is part of this circle, it goes to their meetings at Harvard Business School. Uh, you know, what does this philosophy mean to, to managers? Is there a sort of non-Taylorist way where we, to manage, where we still still get the results? You know, in fact, the argument is that you actually get better results when you've managed to authentically kind of inspire individuals when they don't feel like subordinates, you know, then exercising their initiative, they actually are more productive than the worker who's just doing what they're told. Um, so that's the, that's the hope, at least. Of course, the way that it plays out factory four is a different matter. Um, thank you, Eric, for this amazing, amazing talk. I have two questions. Um, one of them maybe, I hope it's not coming, you know, too far out of uh, left field, but I'm wondering how um, actual creatives, you know, photographers, artists, etc., cetera, were re reacting to potentially um, this new identity. And I know that a lot of them were employed as part of the WPA program. So there were a lot of artists being sent around all around the country. And to my knowledge, they really enjoyed the government funding. Whereas today, you see this sort of entrepreneurial logic also in um, creative sectors, like completely adopted. I'm very curious about how this has changed. Is it a much later phenomenon that this, um, this identity was adopted by the creatives? who who, um, who may be, you know, benefited some from government funding still at that period. And the second question is about how this identity traveled internationally. The, the, the three sorts of categories that you describe are very, I don't know, they, they are very 90s Turkey for me. I met a lot of these people when I was growing up. Um, and usually a lot of these people would have been laid off by, um, you know, transnational companies and they would be, you know, sort of poor, precarious and and that people would come to my house growing up trying to sell these products. So it just feels very, you know, just felt somewhat familiar to me, all these people. Um, and I wondered if if how how this identity got uh, uh, how this identity traveled globally, basically, and when it happened, if you have anything to say about that. Yeah, both really great questions. Um... A lot of the creatives are attracted to a very different kind of political approach. I mean, this is the sort of Michael Denning's story of the, the cultural front um, at this time. There's, uh, there are a lot of people employed by WPA. There are a lot of people who are you know, not just in the creative fields, but in the scientific fields. I've written a bit about this organization called the American Association of Scientific Workers, which sought to organize scientists along a, a labor union model. Um, there was a concerted, especially in 1932, um, before uh, the New Deal, there was a, a very concerted, um, uh, it was called the League of Professionals for Foster and Ford, uh, professional and, and intellectual workers organizing for the, the Communist Party ticket. Um, and so this really disturbs uh, the executive class, it dis disturbs management intellectuals, um, at, at Harvard Business School, this is especially distressing, and this is partly why they feel the need to, you know, they, they, they spend a lot of time at that, in that institution thinking about what it means to be an expert, what it means to be an intellectual, uh, and, and arguing that, you know, this, this ought to, to, for the need for experts to adopt a kind of entrepreneurial mindset, um, subjectivity, rather than a kind of working class self-consciousness. Um, you know, the, the, I, I think that the, the explanation in, in terms of, you know, why creatives are, are, 
are maybe more predisposed to this um, today than in the 1930s is, is precisely because of the disappearance of those institutions. I mean, there, there isn't an, an equivalent to CPUSA. There, there's not a WPA for creatives. Instead, you know, they're, they're, you know, people in creative industries, academia included, are obviously in these, this position of, you know, uh, immense, you know, competition for a, a small number of jobs. Uh, and I think that there's, a, you know, what I want to say is that, you know, beyond just the work of these kind of ideological actors, that material circumstance of scarce work, precarity, um, in the absence of other countervailing institutions, that this kind of way of thinking really becomes natural. Um, in terms of how it spreads internationally, um, the, I, I think that in a lot of places there is a kind of delay. Um, because the, the, the United States enters this period of, you know, industrial maturity, um, you know, disaccumulation uh, much earlier than, than other kinds of capitalisms. Uh, the, the closest uh, is, in, is in Germany. Um, a lot of American ideas about entrepreneurship, especially in the economics discipline in the early 20th century, I show are, are kind of imported from uh, Germans. I mean, Schumpeter comes from the, the Germanophone world. People like Bernard Zombart write about um, entrepreneurialism, um, you know, and that's, that's because Germany at that time, you know, really has the, the, the largest industrial, uh, and most mature industrial economy, um, outside of the United States. Uh, so there's a lot of, I mean, you know, the, the, the sort of, the hope of the, like the Marshall plan, for example, after World War II is to kind of export this kind of already sort of mature, decaying American industrial capitalism elsewhere. So then there's another kind of cycle, you know, where it takes a few decades then um, for those economies to kind of reach this place where, you know, the, the, the number, I mean, you, you see this in, in a lot of different economies, um, especially in, in East Asia, there's, there's a kind of cap on, you know, the, the, a, a point that you hit where the, the fraction of your workforce that you can empl employ in, Industri large scale industrial manufacturing jobs, you know, plateaus and, and starts to decline. And that's really when, um, you know, this, this philosophy, you know, starts to, to spread. So I think there's, there's this kind of, in some, way, in some ways, it's a kind of remarkable consistency progression, but um, there's a series of these kind of temporal dislocations, and you know, it's not happening at exactly the same time in every geography. I mean, what, one thing I would say in response to that is that I think at least for the characters I have known through my life, it, it is not a, it, they choose these jobs or they try to, you know, create odd jobs, um, make their own jobs, but they always look to the government jobs as the thing that they would have rather done because they come with pensions, they come with housing, they come with all the stuff. So it, the, the ideology doesn't transfer quite the yeah. same, even yeah. though maybe some of the material conditions replicate. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. No, I'm definitely, I think the, 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 the parallelism is, is definitely more in terms of the, the way that the capitalist economy organizes its, its workforce more than um, the particular kinds of ideologies or subject positions that proliferate, which vary a lot. Hi, um, thank you for the great and engaging talk. Um, to my question, and maybe this just betrays my own ignorance, but it seems like a lot of this ideology with a sort of emphasis on spontaneity and novelty prefigured you know, cognitivist um, developments in the 50s. So I just wanted to ask, did these figures have sort of theories of mind and obviously the sort of I the tautological idea of sort of to think successfully is, is to be successful is sort of explicitly anti-behaviorist way of thinking. So was there, was there cross-pollination among these figures or? Yeah, well, there's certainly anti-behaviorist. Um, I mean, it's, there's a kind of, and William James in some ways was the, the first to point this out, this kind of strange uh, 30,000 foot sort of homology between psychoanalysis and new thought and that and that both emphasize a kind of mind a mind that cannot be reduced to to the material and a mind that has kind of intrinsic um processes of its own um so to to that extent i mean you you can draw that line i mean the the cognitivists of the 60s would shudder to 
to be compared to, to these these new thought types and, and and they were not you know i mean chomsky was certainly no freudian um but i think that 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 sense of you know the importance of mental interiority you know the mind is as irreducible um you know those, those themes are, are definitely very important to these people Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I just, I wondered if you could, oh, is this, okay, it's working, cool. Um, I wonder if you could speak on the extent to which uh, like settler myths are sort of baked into these ideas about economic activity and entrepreneurialism. Um, like it, it feels particularly relevant to me given the sort of like closure of the frontier in decades prior and like rise of industrial capitalism. And then this sort of emphasis on individualism and self-reliance in new thought ideas and as well as how they also serve as a pressure release valve for economic and political tensions. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, the, the, the frontier is a, a recurring metaphor, especially in the period somewhat after this, in the, the late 30s and 40s, um, really within the New Deal itself, there begins to emerge a sort of an entrepreneurial approach to the theme of development. Um, you see this in a lot of the, the rhetoric of David Lilienthal, the Tennessee Valley Administration uh, administrator, um, you know, different boosters of, of development in the, the Sun Belt, um, you know, and, and in those in those contexts, there's uh, you know, it's, it's it's very on the nose. I mean, there's a sense of these the the, the West becomes a new frontier again, not in the the territorial sense of, of conquest, but in the sense of bringing these places economies up up to speed. Um, with the, the Northeast and um, precisely because they are not yet industrially mature, you know, there's potential still for, you know, there's the need for these kinds of entrepreneurial leader types to, to you know, carve out uh, new territory. Um, you know, I, I think that the, in terms of the rural workforce, you know, in, in some of these direct selling companies, you, you can also, I think, detect um you know a, a bit of a, a kind of you know pioneer fantasy um going on uh though i think in that case the really the operative fantasy is less about carving out you know pushing a new frontier and more a kind of fantasy of these sort of the, the, the small town social world um you know it's it's very uh sort of you know, little town on the little home on the prairie, um, you know, written by an important libertarian activist at this time. Um, you know, this sense of, of the, you know, relatively homogenous, moral, you know, community remote from the bureaucratic centers of power in Washington. You know, this is the, I think, the, the kind of fantasy that a lot of Avon distributors, for example. Um, I just wondered in sort of in the middle of the arc of the early part of uh, what you talked about is uh, America's involvement in the First World War and the in big increase in American government, the size of American government and the large uh, amount of men who came home and the difficulty of reintegrating them into our society. Uh, how did entrepreneurialism uh, play out in, in what you, you saw about, uh, was there, were there doughboys? Uh, extent in your in your tales and also um, entrepreneurialism and gangsterism in our society are hand in hand and isn't this the sort of moment in which the gangster as a figure crystallizes in American culture both great questions <laughs> thanks um, I mean for in my story World War one primarily matters um, because it allows the state to break the uh, labor and left-wing organizing um, that had been been percolating in, in the 1910s. I mean, it, it sets the stage for the roaring 20s um, for this, this enormous accumulation of, of surplus capital, really because um, you know, labor organization is completely crushed. A lot of especially immigrant organizers are 
arrested and, and deported, some are even killed. Um, the, the, it, this is the, the period historians often call the first Red Scare after the, uh, the 1917 Russian Revolution. Um, and it also means that, that, again, thinking, you know, kind of we are talking about with Ege earlier, there's, um, it's a, the disappearance of alternatives. Um, you know, with, if, if, this, if this kind of approach, you know, the, the kinds of organizing that was taking place in the late 19 teens is no longer available, you know, this, this increases the, the purchase of entrepreneurialism as a, a promise way of kind of navigating the economy of the 20s. And, you know, that roaring 20s environment is, is exactly where you find the, you know, the Al Capones. I mean, again, there's, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of, from a sort of economic history perspective, there's a lot of money that's kind of sloshing around at this time with no outlet for productive investment in manufacturing because you don't need, in the 1920s, the economy, the industrial manufacturing economy does not need capital investment to grow, um, you know, for variety of reasons that we don't need to get into. So, so that, you know, it's, it's the same reason why people turn to, you know, stock market speculation. Um, there's, there's just a lot of cash kind of sloshing around. And so this, you know, or racketeering become, does become a, a kind of, um, yeah, an, an unusual vocation, as they would, to say the least. Eric, thank you so much. Thanks what so much. a great afternoon. Um, say one more round of applause.